So welcome to the Dapper Community Call on the 21st of January. Um, we have a fairly short agenda today. Um, we're going to spend most of it with Ryan showing us the Yeoman Dapper Generator that he's built. And he'll give us a demo of that. I'll spend a bit of time just talking about where we are with our roadmap. And then we'll have plenty of time for questions. And if there's not many questions, we'll keep it short after that. So this is the agenda for today at this point. I'm going to unshare myself and I'm going to hand it over to Ryan to talk about the, the Yapa Dapa Gem Yeoman Generator. Excellent. Thank you, Mark. Can everybody hear me? Mark, are you able to hear me? Yes, I'm able to hear you, Ryan. Excellent. Great. Uh, and let's see. Are you able to see my screen? Oh, wrong screen. Let's move this over here. Beautiful. Uh, are you able to see my screen? One note. Oh, one note. Uh, still one note or a command window now? You had the command window to begin with. Oh, got it backwards. That's one note. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Awesome. Great. Uh, all right, I'll give a quick intro here. So my name is Ryan Vollum. I'm a software developer in Microsoft's Office of the CTO. Um, and I've been a contributor on the Dapper project for the last uh, six months or so. Um, today, I'll be demoing a Yeoman generator that helps scaffold a Dapper project. Um, I released a beta version of this uh, a week and a half ago now, um, and I've gone ahead and linked the repo and the NPM package in the chat window here. We'll make sure that the recording has, uh, has a link to it as well. Uh, so when I first got into the cloud native world, I was a little bit paralyzed by all of the concepts, configuration, and decisions that had to be made. Um, I think Dapper helps with a lot of this since it abstracts away a lot of the developer concern. Uh, but resources are still sort of disparate. It's really hard to get started. There's lots of YAML files. There's lots of Docker files, different CLI tools you're using, docs are all over the place. Um, and, and this is just sort of the nature of this space. It's still a fairly nascent space. And so it's hard to get projects started. Um, so I decided to go ahead and build a Yeoman generator. Uh, Yeoman is an NPM package that prompts users with a series of questions uh, and scaffolds out a project for them uh, based on their answers. Uh, albeit popular in the node and web development community, it can be used to scaffold projects in any language. So you'll, you'll see that this uh, Yeoman Dapper generator uh, can be used to uh, scaffold projects in a wide variety of languages. So I'll just go ahead and uh, kick off with a demo here. So I'm going to say Yo Dapper. Um, and I've gotten this generator by NPM installing it. Uh, if you follow the instructions uh, in the repo uh, or on the NPM package page, uh, it'll be pretty straightforward to get started. So the first thing it does is prompt me for what I would like to name my Dapper project. I'll go ahead and call it community call project. And it's going to ask me what microservices in what languages I would like to automatically have scaffolded. I'll be an ambitious developer here and go ahead and select all of these, um, even though it's unlikely you'll ever have a project where you're really using five different languages. Uh, the next thing it's going to ask me is what state store I would like my application to use. Um, so here I've just got listed the uh, current supported state stores for Dapper. There are lots more that are being developed, um, but right now I've just got Redis and Azure Cosmos DB here. I'm going to go ahead and select Redis. And then it'll ask me what pub sub component, if any pub sub component, I would like to use for this. I could select none. I could select any of these supported services. I'll go ahead with Redis streams here. And the last question it'll ask me is what bindings, if any, I would like to use. So let's, let's say my application, I'm going to use Kafka. And let's just go with, um, let's go with an AWS DynamoDB down to binding. And if I selected all of these, uh, all of those manifests would appear in my project. So now it's gone ahead and scaffolded a project for me. Um, it's called Community Call Project, which will live in a new directory. So I'm going to go ahead and open that up. And now I've got my project scaffolded, and I'm looking at it in VS Code. So right off the bat, you'll notice that I have uh, microservices, uh, a microservice directory for each of those microservices I selected. So I've got a C Sharp project here. I've got a Go project. Got a JavaScript project, a Python project, and a TypeScript project. And each of these things have a few important things in them. Um, for one, they're using uh, web frameworks that are idiomatic to those languages, uh, and they're using Dapper. Um, so this Go project, for example, is using uh, Mux. Uh, this JavaScript project is using Express, and it's exposing a bunch of different endpoints. This Python project is using Flask. 
Uh, this TypeScript project, of course, is also using, uh, it's also using Express uh, since it's just compiling into JavaScript code. Uh, and each of them has, uh, you know, tooling idiomatic to that language. So as an example, the package JSON for the, um, for the, uh, for this project has, you know, some of the scripts you'd need to go ahead and run this thing pretty easily. Um, the other, the other, uh, a couple other things that each of these things include, um, one is a Docker file, uh, that sort of shows the best, some of the best practices for building this project into a container image that we can then deploy to Kubernetes. And perhaps the most important thing uh, included in these microservice directories are the readmes, um, which basically serve as, as one canonical place that gives you all the instructions you need to go ahead and run this thing with Dapper in self-hosted mode, or if you scroll down, to go ahead and build a container image with this, deploy it into Kubernetes, and test it in Kubernetes. Um, so instead of having to jump around different docs, you can, you can take this one microservice, uh, run it locally, deploy it into Kubernetes, uh, and you really have all the information you need to go ahead and get started. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, we'll do that with this Python project. So uh, if we take a look at the instructions here for getting started, uh, right off the bat, it says, hey, go ahead and change directories to this Python project. So I'll do that. Uh, it gives me the command I should run to go ahead and install the packages for this thing to run. Um, no, we're not taking any dependency on Dapper here. We're not using the Dapper SDK. We're just using primitives to uh, to call Dapper uh, through uh, just through HTTP. And then it gives me a command here that I can run to uh, run this Python microservice with Dapper. So I'm going to go ahead and run this. And you see that it is successfully running now. Uh, in order to test this, we can pull up another terminal window here and run Dapper list. And sure enough, you see we have a uh, microservice called Pi. Uh, it uh, ex ex exposes the Dapper runtime running on port 3500. It itself is running on port 5000. And this is the command that was run to go ahead and get this thing going. So let's go ahead and test that this thing is successfully working. Um, note that I've already run Dapper init uh, on this machine. So I've already got a uh, Redis state service running locally and a Redis pub sub service running locally. But this also has instructions for uh, how you could use different components if you're running in self-hosted mode. So I'm going to go ahead and open Postman here and make some calls against my Python microservice. And actually, before doing that, I quickly want to just show the code. Um, so this is exposing, like I said, a number of different endpoints that test different uh, Dapper functionality. Um, this, this first endpoint just returns a random number when you call it. So it's just a get endpoint. Uh, and it's not doing anything fancy with Dapper. Um, it's, just, uh, it's just advertising this, uh, this route through Dapper. So we should be able to call this through Dapper. We also have a save number endpoint, which we can post a number to. And it's going to go ahead and uh, post this against uh, the Dapper state endpoint. So we're going to go ahead and persist a number uh, using Dapper. We can go ahead and get the, that saved number by calling the saved number endpoint. And we also subscribe to uh, messages of topic type A and B and have uh, handlers for each of those topic types. So the, the, the uh, Yeoman generator uh, just tests, uh, or rather uh, scaffolds out code for state persistence, state retrieval, service uh, invocation, uh, and PubSub. Um, obviously, we can add more logic to this thing if and when we choose to. But for now, we decided to just keep it, uh, keep it simple and keep it useful. So let's go ahead and call our, uh, our Python random number endpoint. Um, note that I'm already calling port 3500, where my Dapper runtime lives. And I'm telling it it should uh, call a microservice called pi. And it should call the method random number. So I call that. And I got the number 21, and then the number 62, and then the number 68. So this is this thing is working. Let's go ahead and save a number here. So I'm going to go ahead and persist the number 42 by calling the save number endpoint. And we got an OK back. Let's go ahead and test that that successfully worked by calling the get number endpoint. And sure enough, we got the number 42. So we're, we're able to successfully uh, persist and retrieve state through Dapper running in self-hosted mode here. The last thing I'll show in self-hosted, I'm going to go ahead and publish a message of topic type A. So I'm going to go ahead and send this guy. And if we take a look at our, our uh, microservice here, we see that sure enough, uh, the logs show that we received a topic of type A 
uh, with this content uh, of this data, which is exactly what I just sent from Postman. So I was able to really quickly configure a Dapper project with all these different microservices uh, and really quickly show run one of these microservices running in self-hosted node. Now, um, what if I wanted to go ahead and deploy this thing to Kubernetes? Uh, obviously, there's a lot more involved. We have to build an image. We have to uh, push it up. Um, I've included all of the directions here in the readme just so we can minimize the, the overall load there. So I'm going to go ahead and run through those directions as well. Uh, so I'll start by building my image. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and say, let me minimize this guy. I'll go ahead and go back to the Python directory, say docker build slash t ran volume, and we'll call this thing pytest uh, pytest 42. Oops, and we'll pass it the directory. Uh, so it went ahead and built that really quickly because I've already built an identical image. And now we're going to go ahead and push this thing into Docker Hub. And while I'm waiting, I'm going to go ahead and copy this image name. Uh, one of the other things we scaffolded through this Python generator is this deploy directory that includes all the YAML manifests for the project that we'll be deploying. Um, note that there's a manifest for each microservice, there's a manifest for the pub sub and state components, and there are also manifests for the bindings that we selected there. So I'm going to go ahead and open up this Python manifest and I'm going to copy in the name of the container image that I just pushed into Docker Hub. Uh, and I should now just be able to go ahead and deploy this. Uh, the one additional thing I'm going to do before deploying this is give it an external endpoint uh, so that I can easily test it. So you'll notice that here in the directions, um, we also have just some boilerplate code we can use to drop into our YAML file right at the top. And that's going to create an external endpoint. Uh, in this case, I'm using AKS. So it's going to create an external endpoint in AKS. So I can go ahead and test this thing pretty easily. So let's go ahead and go over to that deploy directory. I'll say apply dash f python dot yaml. And if all goes well, we should go ahead and deploy this thing. So I already had a service up there. Uh, I pre-provisioned it so we didn't have to wait for it on this call. Uh, we should be able to see that our pod is now either up and running or being configured. Uh, sure enough, we see here's the Python microservice. Uh, it shows that two out of two containers are ready. Uh, so one of those containers is the microservice itself, uh, while the other container is the Dapper runtime sidecar to that container. Uh, and we should be able now to get logs. Uh, let's see, Python microservice. And I'll give it the container name. Microservice. Cattle logs. There we go. Great. So we can see that uh, this thing is uh, up and running in Kubernetes, uh, and we have just the the uh, logs for the Flask app getting started. Uh, now let's actually try calling this through the external endpoint that was provisioned. So let's go ahead and find out what that external endpoint is. I'm going to run qcattle get service, and we see that this thing is already provisioned. Uh, so I'm going to go back to Postman here. And I'm going to call those same exact endpoints, but uh, through Kubernetes now, uh, through my publicly exposed service. Let's go ahead and send this. Seems to be taking a minute. Hmm. For some reason, it was not able to get a response. Let's make sure we have the right uh, external endpoint there. Python microservice 4083, 20. Yeah. Of course, I tested this right before the call, and it worked no problem. Um, well, I'm not sure what's going wrong here, but instead of belaboring everyone on the call, uh, suffice it to say that uh, following these instructions uh, should successfully uh, deploy this thing into Kubernetes, and you should be able to go ahead and call um, these endpoints uh, through Postman or through curl or through, uh, right. through another. Hey, yeah. Ryan, do you have to do slash method? 
Ah, you're probably right. Do, do slash method slash random number? Uh, no, I shouldn't have to, because I'm not going through the dapper sidecar in this oh, case. Yeah. I'm just calling the microservice uh, directly. Um, <laughs> anybody else have any ideas? Oh, okay. It looks like I was able to save number, uh, so that's good. Uh, and let's see if we can go ahead and get that number. Maybe this is working. Um, state store not found. Ah, I see what's going on. We didn't apply our Redis manifest, so we don't have uh, we don't have a state store with Redis set up yet. So that totally makes sense. Um, so you'll notice that uh, among the manifests I went ahead and spun up uh, was this Redis state manifest. Um, I would go ahead and put the host and password in here. Uh, for a Redis cluster. That Redis cluster could be living in my Kubernetes cluster or it could be a managed service running in Azure or AWS or GCP. Um, in this case, it looks like I don't have one spun up. I'm not going to go ahead and spin one up for this call. Um, but if I were to do that and I did apply this manifest, then Dapper would go ahead and use that and I could uh, pretty easily save uh, and get numbers uh, from there. Still not sure why this random number endpoint isn't working. Oh, it seems to be working now. Excellent. Um, so I'm, I'm successfully uh, invoking a service uh, that's using Dapper through, um, you know, through Kubernetes uh, with a publicly, uh, a publicly exposed endpoint. Uh, so that's, I think, just about all I had to demo. Um, as far as next steps, uh, as I mentioned at the start here, uh, this Yeoman generator is a beta release. Uh, I'm definitely looking for folks to use it, uh, give feedback, and contribute. You'll note that there are a few issues uh, in the repo already out there. I'm more than happy to take contributions there. Uh, I'm specifically not married to any of the boilerplate code for any of these languages. Um, for the most part, the code is idiomatic to the language, uh, but I, I know that you know, people tend to have uh, very strong opinions about the languages they use, and I'm more than happy to take uh, suggestions or contributions uh, in any of that boilerplate code. And also, as I mentioned right now, we're just uh, exposing uh, service invocation, uh, state persistence and retrieval on PubSub. Um, and we can, we can discuss in the open source uh, if and what other functionality we should uh, make part of just the boilerplate code for these services. Uh, I'm also not married to the Docker files for each of these uh, languages. Um, you know, each, each different language has a sort of different Docker file based on uh, what the open source community tends to do for these things, but if you have uh, any thoughts or opinions uh, on, on how we're building these images, uh, definitely happy to take contributions there as well. Um, and all up, I hope this generator is useful for you, uh, and I'm excited to get any kind of feedback, positive or negative. So anybody have any questions on the call? Um, yes, this is Arthur. Um, hey, Arthur. So, um, how easy would it be to add a new language, for example, if I want to use Java? Um, it would be pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm happy to give just a quick two-minute walkthrough of what the Yeoman generator code itself looks like, um, just so people would have a sense uh, for how they would contribute, if that sounds like a valuable use of time here. Yeah, I would show you a little bit of that as well. I'm also interested in just showing the components folder as well, just to show. Yeah, you. yeah no problem. Um, okay, so I'll quickly show the Yeoman generator code. Uh, can people see the new uh, VS Code window that just pulled over? Yes. Great. Um, so uh, I built this Yeoman generator using TypeScript because TypeScript is the best language ever. Um, it compiles into JavaScript code. Specifically, Yeoman looks for code in an app directory. So you'll notice that the compiled source code ends up getting deployed or getting uh, compiled into a, a directory called app. Um, the reason I used app instead of lib or build or any of the other uh, more uh, common terms is just that this is where Yeoman is looking for this stuff. Um, so Yeoman expects an index.ts uh, that extends this generator, and they expect a few different lifecycle methods. One of the lifecycle methods here is prompting, uh, one of them is configuring, one of them is writing, one of them is installing, and the other one is, is end. Um, and so it's uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, Yeoman's documentation is, is quite good um, just to get a sense for you know, how we're prompting for these things. Um, Archer, to your question, you know, if you wanted to support uh, Java as well, we could go ahead and add Java as a choice here for the questions. Uh, the responses to these questions end up in a uh, key value dictionary uh, under, under languages. Um, so you'll notice uh, this.answers.languages has all of these languages. Um, 
And then the way I've modeled a Dapper project, uh, I've actually got a type file here that, um, uh, that you would add you know, Java to, for example, if and when we, we add Java to the options here. Uh, and so uh, a Dapper application uh, is something that has a name. It has a collection of microservices. Um, it, may, it has an, a collection of bindings it may or may not use. It may have a state store, and it may have a PubSub component. Um, now, one thing to note is uh, Dapper will, uh, in the next release, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong on the call, um, support multiple state stores and multiple PubSub uh, pub in instances. So we'll want to go ahead and update this generator to reflect that as well. Um, I'm using uh, string literals to set the different uh, options here for languages that are allowed. So we could go ahead and add Java here as a language. Uh, and we would also uh, add the Java code in this templates directory uh, under languages in a directory called Java. Um, the last thing you would do to contribute a new language uh, is to update this files directory, uh, or rather this files uh, uh, file, uh, to include um, the, uh, the path to you know, the microservice that you've gone ahead and put the boilerplate code for. Um, so happy to answer any questions for anyone who's thinking of contributing a new language uh, or changing any code there. Um, but that's the, just the really quick and dirty run through of, of how the Yeoman generator itself is, is laid out. Thank you. Does, yeah, no problem. Any other questions? Yeah, could you, um, could you just go through the components directory and just show what generated inside there because it was based on your selection, yes? Yeah, yeah, no problem. Uh, so let me pull up, oh, here we go, great. So you'll notice there's a components directory and a deploy directory. I'll actually show the deploy directory and then I'll make a quick note about that, that components directory because that, that should be going away um, once, a, once an issue gets resolved in Dapper. So the deploy directory here has uh, all of the manifests that, um, that I need to run my application. Uh, so it's got the manifests for each of those languages. Uh, we saw the Python one and added an external service to it. Um, we've also got this, uh, you know, the, the state store and PubSub instance we wanted to get spun up. Um, so we just, we've got everything here just so we can quickly, uh, you know, uh, add whatever information is necessary to get this component running with Dapper. And then when we went, when we, uh, went through that um, Yeoman uh, dialogue, it also asked us if we wanted to use any bindings. Um, and we selected AWS DynamoDB and a Kafka binding. Uh, and so you'll see that um, what's included here is just the, the manifest without the you know, metadata, without the access key, without the secret, for you to go ahead and quickly fill that in. Um, and the goal here is that you know, we should minimize developers' time uh, spent you know, uh, on GitHub, bouncing through different repos, looking for manifests that they need, and should instead just include them all in one place so it's really easy to get started. Um, each of these also has a little comment at the top that uh, link the appropriate Dapper documentation uh, for how to spin this thing up um, in, case, in case anybody needs uh, any, any sort of assistance here. Uh, so one thing to note is that all the microservices that get spun up uh, use state and use PubSub. Um, right now, I'm not doing any like magic code generation or anything. If the user selected that they want to have bindings, I'm really just including this manifest in there. Uh, just to make it easier for them to uh, to get started with the binding. And then a quick note on the components directory. If you're running Dapper in self-hosted mode, uh, when you run that, that uh, Dapper app, um, so when you say Dapper run and you pass whatever command you need for that microservice, it spins up a directory for you called components. Um, if you already have a directory called components, it goes ahead and just respects whatever components are in there before, you know, before spinning up its own. So before using Redis or, or, um, or Redis message bus or Redis streams in this case. Uh, so the point of this top level components directory, and there are instructions in each readme about this, um, is basically to say like, hey, if, if you want to run this thing in self-hosted mode and you want to use bindings that are uh, or rather uh, components that are different from the ones that Dapper uses by default, you can go ahead and copy those manifests into your microservice. Um, the reason I have it here at the top level is because I wanted to avoid just automatically duplicating it across all of the different microservices, which could get a little bit confusing for people. Um, eventually, uh, I know there's a plan for 
the Dapper CLI to take a code path to a components directory um, so that we wouldn't have to have a uh, different components directory in each microservice and could instead just say Dapper run, you know, Python app uh, and path uh, and then pass the directory uh, where all of the uh, important manifests are, um, you know, for going ahead and running a thing in self-hosted mode. Does that make sense? Yes, it makes total sense. Great. Okay. Um, well, if nobody has any more questions, uh, then uh, that's all I've got. Definitely reach out if you have any questions um, and would absolutely love your contributions uh, or even just your usage uh, and feedback. Yeah, have you posted I've got the one. I've got one more. So, oh, sorry for interrupting you, Mark. Oh, yeah, no, no, go, no go ahead. Um, in your little demo, it looked like selecting the languages is a check instance you can select one or more but in the real world not everybody writes every microservice in a different language you might have a bunch of them in one a bunch of them in another yeah. is there any plan to come up with how that would work since there, i can't say an easy way to do that in yeoman yeah there, there's no like so one way we could do it in yeoman it's a little bit hacky with yeoman but you can you can have a sort of multi-turn dialogue where yeoman asks you uh follow-up questions based on your previous answers. So one thing we could do, let's say you selected C sharp go, you know, just, you know, let's just say you just selected C sharp, but you actually intend to have 10 different microservices written in C sharp. Um, one thing we could do is have Yeoman ask a follow-up question saying how many of these microservices do you want spun up? At the end of the day though, we're really just going to be copying and pasting the same directory across the project multiple times. Um, so the, the way I'm inclined to lean um, is really anybody who wants multiple of one language microservice should feel totally empowered to take that directory that got spun up and just copy it and paste it a few times um, and just change, you know, change the name in there. Um, I think down the road, if, if there does seem like there's value in having that follow-up prompt and automatically spinning up X number of projects with different names and different config, um, I think it's something we could consider, but for now, I just wanted to keep it simple. All right, well, for any real world situation, that's most likely going to be the scenario. That people are going to be using the same language with multiple different microservices in that language? Yeah, in other words, they're not going to guarantee that each microservice must be in a different language. That's probably not a valid assumption that will probably ever exist in a real yeah. application. Yeah, no, I think, I think you're totally right there. Um, the goal here was really just to make it easy for people to select the microservice or maybe microservices they are going to use. From your, from your perspective, um, is it a heavy lift for somebody, say, to select C Sharp here uh, and then, uh, you know, just, just clone that microservice several times on their own? Like, would, from your perspective, would there be substantial value in having that follow-up prompt to uh, automatically spin up multiple versions of that C Sharp microservice? Yeah, especially with different names when you get into your deploy manifests and everything else that yeah. you, you have to make sure they don't step on each other and Yeah, yeah, okay. So that's without actually a, a name for the for a name for the microservice it, It's gonna be a lot of moving stuff around and when you do that, you know, you always st Forget one miss one stomp on one and then you start going crazy trying to figure out what you did yeah, yeah, no, that's true. Yeah, th that would definitely involve a little bit more complexity from Yeoman because we'd have to start templating the name generation. Uh, right now, this generator isn't using any templates at all, but it's definitely something that is doable uh, and definitely something um, that, uh, that I, I think we should, we should definitely consider doing. So I, I appreciate the feedback. And the other one little tiny thing was when you generate like the deployment manifest or the, the uh, component manifest. Yeah, you know, for for your bindings and everything. Yep. It might be a good idea just to comment out the password one and put both flavors and put both flavors in it. The one where you're adding it directly or the one where you're adding it from the secret store. Because every time I have to do that, I can never remember I have to find the documentation for how mm. you specify a secret store. You know, it's one of those things that you do so very infrequently that you can never remember and takes you forever to find it in the docs. Yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, 
Would you be willing to just file a really quick issue on the generator to that effect? I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to do that. I think that's a pretty low hanging fruit, um, uh, but it'd be good just to have a, a few issues that reflect that. Uh, yeah, uh, does, is the repo for this posted somewhere, the URL to it? Yep, I posted it on the call. Um, happy to post it again if it's gotten lost in, in the messages. I don't know, Mark. Do we do you want to? Will you want update the the GitHub main page or something with that? Probably be very useful. Yeah, I'll update the GitHub main page. I, I just reposted it um, in the chat window. It's uh, GitHub slash dapper slash generator dash dapper. So go there and, let, and raise issues against that repo. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks so much. All right. Any more questions uh, before we move on? All right, that's great. So thanks, Ryan. Fantastic. No problem. No problem at all. I've uh, stopped my share now. Perfect. Let me just share my screen here. So let's just uh, carry on a little bit and talk about what's happening with our release schedule, and then we will open it up for questions. minimize this moment so if i so one thing i always did want to point out by the way that if you had missed it that mark uh, did a talk with scott hanselman on dapper um if you go to i'll put this in the chat window here this is a uh, inside here let's look up the chat window i'll post it afterwards this is a great talk that mark gave with scott in terms of talking about dapper the reasons behind it all why we got it built um, and you can hear his viewpoint on it and all. So I suggest you go and check this out and listen to it all. It's only about 30 minutes long. From the milestone plan perspective, we've sort of finalized our dates now. We're working towards the 3.0 runtime for, uh, uh, for Dapper. Just move this out of the way here. And uh, the dates that we have now, if I can just get back to this refresh on this page for us. Uh, the dates we have now are our dates with inside February here. So we got a freeze date of um, of Kirkby on the 6th of February and then we start our end game on the 10th of February with a release date on the 13th of February. So that's the dates now we have for our 4.0 runtime. What we'll do in our next community call is that we'll talk a lot more about what's in that release. We'll talk about multiple state stores. We'll have another update on the Java SDK and any other and any other issues related to that because it will be just just before we effectively do the code freeze date on that. So that's the thing to watch out for on there. Outside of that, um, outside of that, I don't have anything else to cover at the moment other than you know we're working towards you know addressing issues that you raise inside the repos and you know thank you for all your contribution on some of those things. So at this point now I'm going to stop sharing and I will open it up to questions that people may have. Um, feel free to post them into the chat window. Um, we had a couple of there already. One of them was uh, one of them was is there going to be any, any integration between Dapper and Rudder? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, Dapper for Rudder, for those who don't know, is the Kubernetes implementation of the open application model. Uh, the open application model allows you to have metadata to describe an application and how it is deployed into a number of different environments. And Rudder is the implementation that allows you to deploy an application described by the open application model onto Kubernetes. Yes, there is integration there. If you actually go into the open application model description and you put in the uh, annotations, for Dapper, they get passed through when you do your deployment down to Dapper itself, and it allows you to deploy it. What I suggest I do is that in our next community call, which will be on the 4th, I will get a person from the Open Application Model team to come and give us a demo of what OM is like with Rudder and Dapper. We'll have that on the next call. Um, I couldn't get it today because he's doing another call instead, but we'll do that on the 4th. So that's in two weeks time. We'll, we'll include that as part of the call as well. If not, we'll do it the one after that, in one of those two. So yes, the answer to your question is there is integration. I will also try and post a link later about how to do all that and we'll update the docs. Um, questions about the Yeoman support multiple applications. 
multiple services. Yes, we talked about that. And and Yamna replied to the other question. Good. So we have about 20 minutes. Uh, this is time for open Q&A. In the open Q&A, you can ask any question you like, like what is Dapper? What do I care about at all? Anything down to a particular API? Feel free to open up your mic and just ask questions that way or post questions in the chat window. Uh, it's a complete open discussion. Any question is valid, including roadmap or what we intend to do with Dapper or a particular issue that you want to raise. So feel free to go ahead. Yeah, hello. Hi. Yeah, so um, I was looking at the human generator earlier. So I was hoping if um, there could be a future whereby um, we could introduce some sign up, some sort of um, CI CD, like um, generating a Travis YAML file so that can use to auto deploy using CI CD processes. I think um, this is Ryan here. Uh, I think there's, I think there's all kinds of uh sort of helpful build and develop and publish uh stuff we could add to the yeoman generator i'd be hesitant to add too much but um i definitely think that you know everyone needs ci cd and i think if there is a low-hanging fruit there uh, we should definitely consider adding it um if if you have a specific sort of process in mind um i'd love it if you could open an issue on the repo uh and sort of run through it um but uh, I, I guess, what specifically do you have in mind here? Just like a, a Travis uh, YAML file that describes the CICD? Yeah, something like this. Um, yeah, definitely go ahead and open an issue. And uh, I, I would just want to make sure not to get too opinionated in the generator and give people multiple options. Um, you know, Travis is, is one tool that people use. Uh, people, you know, use several different tools. Uh, but it's definitely something I'm open to considering. Okay, okay great. We have a question about um, from Harshish. What about service meshes? How do they work with Dapper? I see that Phil has posted a link to Wiki on this generally. Uh, this has become such a common question. I'm going to spend something, some time over the next couple of weeks to make sure that we show a true example of how Dapper and service meshes work together. So yes, Dapper and service meshes work in harmony. You can use Dapper with some of those features and you can use service meshes for the networking capabilities. So if you're going to use service meshes for the network routing, go, you can, such as Linkerd or Istio, you can do that in conjunction with Dapper. You know, the level of overlap that there were does exist is that Dapper does provide direct method invocation of other services, as, as Ryan showed in calling you know, rat call random number and there's other methods inside there. And if you want to use Istio instead to do that or some other service mesh, you can. So yes, they work together, but I recognize that having a true example of how these work would be helpful to clarify that. So we'll look towards having that on the community call, maybe not the next one, but the one after that sometime in February, we'll look to do a demo of that because the next one we're going to focus on the 4.0 runtime race. Hey Mark, uh, I have a question for you. Um, how does how does Dapper work it from a dev environment perspective where you may have, uh, you know, dependent resources sometimes that are kind of too much to bring up on your machine, maybe, I don't know, pub sub or cache or something. Is there is there some type of plan for like almost like a a mock type of um, provider or something in, in, that, that swaps out things and kind of works from a, a dev workflow? Uh, good question. No, <laughs> at this point in time. Um, so you want to just mock all the interfaces? Um, I, I guess sometimes, you know, trying to bring up a whole a whole architecture together sometimes can be too much for a dev machine. So you're trying to bring up uh, things and maybe a, a cache, for instance, instead of bringing up the whole whatever red cache on your machine or whatever. Uh, you an in-memory in cache would be sufficient, you know, just for testing. Yeah, we haven't spent any time thinking about that. Um, I don't know if you have any. Uh, I, I'll add a, well, just one comment as well. Is that um, it's a great idea. Some part uh, to kind of help there is that Dapper itself allows you to be platform agnostic, right? So. 
you can, if you had like a whole architecture built out on say Cosmos DB or DynamoDB or, or whatever it is in the cloud, um, then you can use a much lighter weight thing on your dev machine, such as Redis, for example, uh, and your code doesn't change, right? That's one of the benefits of DAPA. So that you can actually, in some ways, mock with a lower cost or lower resource cost alternative on your machine without changing your code. And then when you do go to deploy it to the cloud, you can simply swap out those components, right? Yeah, and I guess that's that's, that's perfect. That's a, that, that's a great, great um, answer. It, it does uh, give you that ability to do that, right? Uh, I guess what I was wondering is, is there going to be a kind of a suite of those uh, substitution tools that do work that are lighter weight, you know, something that replaces the state store, something that replaces. Oh yeah. That's, that's a great suggestion. A sub, like um, if we would say, Oh, these are the recommended things to use in development yes. that, you can, that are lighter weight on your local machine yes. and use these development. And then when you go to, to, to build this out, um, swap out these components for, you know, which right. one. now yeah. I want to, now I want to use Cooper, uh, you know, now I want to use Cooper, you know, um, you know, Reddit, Redis, or I want to use some, some, you know, Cosmos for my state store when I'm in production, right. but locally yeah. it kind of swaps out to using these lighter weight items. Right. Yeah. That's exactly what I interpreted when you first said it. I said, no, we haven't done, it's a great idea for certain. And we've only just sort of gone down the path of creating sort of a local development environment. You know, we're working closely with the VS team to create a debugging a plugin for, um, for VS code for Dapper. And, and improving the deployment experience there and how you do the debugging experience, but your general environment experience, we haven't put any time into that yet, but it's a great idea. Thank you. Uh, you, can, you can use the Azure Storage Emulator or Cosmos Emulator. Yes, there, I think there is, I think no question is, is how do you set up a nicer environment out of the box without having sort of all the heavyweight components? And the answer is, is yeah, great. But, it's one of those things that will probably be, we'll look at more in our roadmap as a request build. So let's raise an issue on that and start to see the feedback from it. Okay, any more questions? I think there was one I missed back here further. Oh, no. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we'll call it an end. Thanks, Ryan, for doing the demo today. Okay. End of And uh, actually, we just got one. Does Dapper integrate with HashiCorp Vault? Uh, yes, I think we did an implementation of that, yes. It does an implementation of one of its secret sources with HashiCorp. So yeah, so Ryan, thanks for doing the demo today. Um, the next call will be on the 4th of February, which is two weeks time from now. And we'll, I'll put up an agenda before that, but as I mentioned, it will probably be focusing heavily on the 4.0 runtime, particularly the Java and the Java SDK work that we've done. And we'll do demonstrations of multiple state stores inside that and um, talk about the other work that's happened inside that release so that you can all get prepared for it all. Because it's been quite a long release. It's been quite... Uh, it's going to be quite a feature rich, heavy release. So unless there's any last uh, questions. One, re yeah, really quick. Um, this goes back to a while ago. There's been this, uh, I think a man opened the issue on GitHub about the dynamic top, uh, the dynamic pub subtopics, but there seems to be more and more interest in that. And, it could be used for actor events. And then now there's been a couple more GitHub issues on actor events, is that, but not really any comments on those issues. Is that actually really being looked at? And now that Amon's on the call as well, since he was, I guess he was out during the last one. Yeah, yeah we, we, have, we have looked at the dynamic pub sub issue, but it, it's not part of this release. It would be part of some future milestone. We haven't committed uh, resources to it yet. Okay, but it it's has it's going to get, at some point get some attention. It's not yeah. one of those things that's just getting blown off. I uh, know it will be. It will be implemented. We plan to implement that. The dynamic pops up. 
Yeah, and if anyone wants to pick it up um, and help us, you know, it's an open source project, so feel free. Is it is there an issue open on that, by the way, you're on? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't mind uh, having a sneaking a peek. If somebody could post it in the chat, that'd be great. Yeah, I, I just posted in the chat. Yeah, thanks, awesome. Simone. Mm -hmm. Come on. Great. Okay. Any other topics or questions that people want to raise? All right, we'll call it done then for today. So thanks for joining on this call today. I'll post this on the YouTube channel within today and uh, see you on the 4th. And I will point an agenda before that. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Oh, thanks, bye.